Welcome to Ephraim Slide Assembly. The following podcast is from our teaching series on the Torah, Genesis to Deuteronomy. It is February the 24th, 2024, and we are observing the Sabbath of God. My name is Doris Smith, announcer and member of the ministry team here at Ephraim Slide Assembly. This week's lesson covers Exodus chapter 27, verse 20, to Exodus chapter 30, verse 10. Universally, this section of scripture is known as Tetzaveh. It means, you shall command. Down through the ages, the call of Yeshua to a new life in God's kingdom resonates. He asks if we want a better life. Those who want a better life with the peace and joy rise and answer him and are healed. Join Pastor Frank Smith now as he explains how you can answer the call of God. Now here is Pastor Frank Smith bringing this week's teaching entitled, So You Want a Better Life? Welcome one and all to this week's teaching from Exodus chapters 27 28, 29, and 30, entitled, So You Want a Better Life. I'd like to begin this week with a little information that'll be helpful. If you or anyone you know suffers from depression, mental illness, schizophrenia, addictions, consistent medical problems which cannot be diagnosed, bad luck, or anything related to these, or maybe you just know inside that there's something more than you're receiving, then we have the answer. God has given 270 special instructions, especially for Christians. They are comprised of the Ten Commandments and 260 detailed instructions spread out in the first five books of the Bible. We have God's promise that if we study and follow these 270 instructions, we will prosper physically, financially, spiritually, and emotionally. And I just want to let you know, our ministry exists to fill that need. The history of those who have studied with us for one year or more is that their life has changed for the better. They all have experienced miracles or a greater peace of mind because they began to obey God's instructions. God has guaranteed it. Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Now, God made these promises because he loves us and wants us to have eternal life in his kingdom. Second Peter 3 verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he has another wonderful promise in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Folks, there is an insight to the character of God. God is non-denominational. It behooves us to follow him not the doctrine of any one group. These group doctrines have a tendency to be too liberally focused. In life, if you're listening to or putting your trust in any religious organization or any political camp, there is a high probability you are brainwashed. Or maybe you're just not impressed with the emotionalism of church and you need something that will really help you. Come with us on our journey to know the character of God and to live in his world. We have learned that the word of God is sufficient doctrine and inspiration without men injecting their doctrine. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And in Mark chapter 7, verse 7, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. 
Now, it's just a fact that many denominations teach traditions while ignoring the commandments. Traditions won't heal you nor shield you from the pagan ways of the world that you pick up in life. God's commandments will heal those wounds. Obeying his commandments will shield you from the disastrous outcome of sin. If you have been with a group that studies scripture too liberally, you will not know the character of God and how you should live under the constitution of God. You must desire the truth, and there is only one source of truth, and that is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you read the entire Bible, and you put all the facts together, and you study until you have eliminated all discrepancies, now you're on the path of truth. Even in math and in bookkeeping, figures are verified several different ways before they're trusted. Thus, the rule of God is found in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Parallels to this are found in Matthew 18, verse 16, where Yeshua said it, and 1 Timothy 5, 19, and in Revelation 11, verse 10, where Paul and John covered it. All these New Testament scriptures were taken from the Old Testament, the original Bible, Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, and Numbers 35, verse 30. Every thought or idea that we glean from scriptures must be proven. You have to find the same concept in more than one place in your Bible before you can believe that what you're thinking is true. And God has said in his scripture that you can't be convicted of sin without two or three witnesses. The same applies to scripture. It is a safeguard to make sure you understand things properly. Don't depend on one scripture to establish doctrine. Research and prove everything. Get the big picture. Now let me give you an example. God has told us not to judge. If we judge, we're making ourselves the prosecution. Satan is the accuser. If we judge, we're agreeing with him and our witness and Satan's accusations are enough to convict a person of sin that leads to death. Satan desires to kill, steal, and destroy. God's character is to rescue and deliver people from death and remold them into the life of Yeshua. Lesson. If you desire to see someone convicted of sin and put to death, you've joined the legions of Satan. If you desire people to be rescued, saved, and rehabilitated, you belong to the kingdom of God. So don't judge, and don't commit Lashon Hara. According to Wikipedia, that means Lashon Hara is the holistic term for speech about a person or persons that is negative or harmful to them even if it's true, it is speech that damages the person that is talked about either emotionally or financially or lowers them in the estimation of themselves or others. That's the definition from Wikipedia. In other places, it's called the evil tongue, James 3 verse 8. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. The most common type of Lashon Hara is reklut in Hebrew, which means gossip. Gossip is repeating what other people have said or done or spreading negative things about others. As an illustration, Psalm 34 verses 13 and 14 says, Guard your tongue from evil, your lips from deceitful speech. Other references are Leviticus 19.16 and Exodus chapter 23, verse 1, among others. Exodus 23, verse 1 says, You shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Now we've set the stage for this week's lesson. It comes from Exodus chapter 27, verse 20 through Exodus chapter 30, verse 10, and I hope you'll read it because now we're going to explain it. If you've not read it, stop the podcast right here and read it. So I want you to see the big picture, and the first part of that picture in today's lesson is that God's people are set apart for God's purposes. 
We begin by seeing when Moses was interceding for Israel after the golden calf incident, he petitioned God to strike his name from God's book instead of destroying Israel. Moses said, blot my name out of your book. Now that word is sefherka. Broken down, this word, sefherka, means sefer, which means book, and ka means yours, your book. Ka comes from the Hebrew letter kaf, which comes at the end of the word and has a gematria of 20. The value 20 connects us to something, so let's go find out what it is. Moses was willing to give up his life for the mixed multitude of people who were being formed into God's kingdom, God's nation on the earth. This is type and shadow of Yeshua, who was willing and indeed did lay down his life for the sinner who would confess their sin and take up the mantle of God. Now the point is that instead of God blotting Moses' name out of the book of life, God blotted his name out of the 20th parashah. Remember the value 20 in the 20th parashah. That's the one we're studying today. God recognized and honored the kind of love that Moses had in his heart for the people, a sacrificial love such as God would display through Christ Jesus. Read this portion of Scripture and you will find that Moses' name does not appear in the parashah. And this is why this parashah begins with the words, You shall make an altar of acacia wood five cubics long and five cubics wide, the altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. Now, God normally begins such a teaching with something like this. God instructed Moses to make an altar. Even though Moses' name is not mentioned, God's instructions are clearly for him. This week's scripture portion has some very clear messages in it. Revelation 14, verse 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now here's the lesson in that. Religious organizations of today teach us that we must have faith in Jesus, but let me tell you that will not help you. You must be trained in the commandments and have the same faith that Jesus had. You see, that which is common is not holy. We must be set apart for God's purposes, which is being trained in the commandments to be a unique people forming God's nation, Israel. We must be trained to set ourselves apart from the world. We begin by worshiping God on the day that he ordained the Sabbath. That's Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown, a time set apart from the other six days. In Hebrew, it's called Kodesh. And that means set apart. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden for a moment. Satan said to Eve in Genesis 3 verse 4, Then the servant said to the woman, You shall surely not die. Today people will say, Surely God doesn't care what day you worship him. It was a lie in the Garden of Eden, and it's a lie today. Exodus 20 verses 8 through 10. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and he hallowed it. The Sabbath must be a time of training to make our thoughts, our words, and our deeds align with the instructions of God. So the question arises, why must we be set apart? Because if we love God, our kingdom is not of this world. It's not a place. It's a spiritual kingdom that this world refuses to recognize. It is eternal and everlasting while the kingdom of the earth is physical and temporary. The ideas of man will not prevail, but the laws of God and his kingdom will be forever. 
Yeshua, whom you call Jesus, prayed to the Father, saying in John 17, verses 15 and 16, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Folks, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Love, listen to me, love is the key. God loves us without restriction. We must love him with the same intensity and love each other. We are to be refined because we must love God enough to be persecuted like he was. He was rejected, despised by men, beaten, bruised, pierced. We must die to self to the point we're willing to lay down the flesh and allow the Spirit of God to thrive and be ready to give up our earthly vessel for his name's sake. John 15, verse 13, Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. If we really love God, we must be ready to stand for his principles even if we have to die for it. Matthew 24, verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. What's the lesson? Folks, this is a serious matter. Are you willing to give up your life maintaining your obedience to God's principles? It's a very real thing that you may be called on to do that. Do you have that kind of faith? Are you convinced that God's way is the only way? Is it true enough for you to give up your life for him? If you are, you have the faith of Jesus, for he declared it and he did it. God's end time, holy, set apart people are those who are Sabbath and feast keepers, a people who will keep God's written Torah and have the testimony of Yeshua on their lips. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2 tells us that we can have peace with God through Christ. And in verses 3 through 5, it says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, the scripture says, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now we've drawn from this portion so far a picture of being set apart for God's holy kingdom. Now we see a picture of what our resolve must be. Exodus 27 verses 20 and 21 shows us that our resolve must be to be the light of God. We are branches in the lampstand, which is the body of Christ. Listen to the scripture. And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually in the tabernacle of meeting outside the veil, which is before the testimony. Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statue forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. Now, as is common in all Torah portions, there are glimpses here of the Messiah in this portion of Scripture. The first one is in the harvesting of the olives. To harvest olives, the trees are beaten until the limbs with olives on them fall off. Then the limbs are beaten on the ground to remove the olives. And this reminds us that our Lord was beaten and tortured and that we are to be refined as pure as the oil that's pressed from the olives. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I want to encourage you today because whatever we have to go through in this life is refining us to be as pure as the oil pressed from the olives. The problems thrown at us by the world teach us to persevere in the written word and the living word of God. In this world, we're in a war with anti-God forces that want to destroy us. 
Revelation 12, verse 17, highlights that. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Christ Jesus. The woman in this scripture is Israel, not Israel as in Jews, but Israel as in the kingdom of God. That is every person who accepts Christ as Lord and obeys his commandments. The menorah in the temple reveals the presence of God. That is what the world must see in us, the presence of God. God commanded that the light of the menorah never go out. Folks, our light should never go out. To make the oil, the olives were bruised when the limbs they were on were beaten to separate them from the limb. Yeshua was bruised when he was separated from his followers and hung on a tree for our sakes. Once the olives were gathered, they would be inspected just like Yeshua was inspected before he's crucified and just like the lamb to be sacrificed was taken on the 10th day of Nisan and inspected for four days before it was sacrificed. Then the olives were gathered and taken to a large vat where a donkey was hooked to an arm with a big stone wheel on it that ran around the vat crushing the olives. The oil from the first crushing was used for the menorah in the temple. The crushed olives that yielded their first oil was then placed in an accordion-like press with a large stone placed on top of it overnight to extract even more oil from the olive. As Yeshua was placed on a tree, the world would have thought, surely this man did something wrong. But in Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 5, we find the plan of God. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Now Yeshua warned us that we would be hated for his sake, but only now we're realizing that what he said was true. They will persecute us just because we stand for God's principles. It's already begun. People are already being persecuted. They will try to put us in jail for no reason than obeying the Lord our God. The process of our tribulation began in the Garden of Gethsemane and Olive Grove. Luke 22, verse 44. And being in agony, Jesus prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Folks, that kind of sweat is oil and water mixed with blood. Jeremiah 11, verse 16. The Lord called your name green olive tree, lovely and of good fruit. With the noise of great tumult, he has kindled fire on it and its branches are broken. The pure oil from the pounded olive symbolizes the refinement and purity coming through in our character due to being pounded in adversary trials and tribulations. This life is a test in our perseverance in keeping the commandments and holding fast to the testimony of Yeshua. Now here's the lesson. When we are pressed, that is when we produce the pure oil that allows our lamps to burn continually. When we go through trials and tribulations and we overcome them, our testimony for God makes us shine bright, and the more we go through it causes our light to to burn brighter and continuous. Now, in our big picture, we have seen that we must be set apart for the purposes of God, which means we must unselfishly serve God and others. We see that we no longer do what we want or try to make God do what we want. We follow Him and do things as He commanded them to be done because it's for our own good. We also see that our testing sanctifies us and that we are to learn his commandments and do them. Now we need to see God's character. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, 
and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. God is the creator of everything, and he could take over like a dictator, but instead he involves us as partners with him, calling us to be priests and kings with him. He gives us his glory, and that word glory means character. He gives us his character. Our being a light to the world is not shining on the arbitrary head knowledge of the written word, but reflecting God's character in our conduct. His character is selflessness. Yeshua is the light, life, and the character of God. You cannot know Yeshua or the Father except through the written word. So God's people will study his word, meditate on his word, and practice the word until the written word becomes natural. Psalm 119 verse 105. Your word, that's the written Torah, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. His Torah is our light. His Torah is his character. Isaiah 49, verse 6. Indeed, God says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. You see, the whole purpose of our salvation and our sanctification is to be his disciples going out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, taking the knowledge of salvation, which is Yeshua, and the word of his covenant to the ends of the earth so that God's bride can be perfected in holiness in preparation for the marriage of the Lamb of God. John chapter 8, verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. From the character of God, the word of God came into the world to be a light to the world. If he was rejected, despised by men, persecuted, went through trials and tribulations and temptations, and overcome in every area, it's an example for us to be overcomers. For we are to pick up our cross daily and follow him. John 3 verse 19. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Refusing to accept Yeshua as Lord and following his commandments is darkness. God came to earth in human form to unselfishly sacrifice himself so that we might have an opportunity to be included in his kingdom. He has seven bodies, and that is why there are seven branches to the menorah. He is king and savior, a descendant of David who will defeat God's enemies and restore God's kingdom on the earth. He is our priest, one who will restore proper sacrifice in the temple. He is a prophet like Moses who will restore the law of God. Deuteronomy 18 verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. He is a heavenly agent, the son of man, a human appointed judge of humanity in the end times. He is the suffering servant. God's servant upon whom God's spirit rests, meek but a bringer of justice and a restorer of the people. He is the second Adam, the Messiah, an antitype of the first Adam who reverses the sin of Adam. In our big picture, we look to be purified and sanctified. He is the word through whom God created the universe. The letters that he wrote to the seven churches in Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3 are present, not past. The twelve tribes of Israel are the end-time bride making herself ready, but it is clear that the bridegroom sees that his churches are still holding on to darkness, and that is why he rebukes five of the seven churches. Only Smyrna and Philadelphia are perfected in brotherly love and are willing to die for the truth. All other Messianic believers are holding on to some paganism. 
Each of these menorahs or assemblies of called out believers is being lovingly admonished by Yeshua in hopes they will let go of the paganism that they're holding on to. Some have the spirit of Jezebel. Others do the deeds of Balaam where people curse themselves by leaving God's ways, embracing paganism, adultery, and murder. There's a lesson When people say they are filled with the Holy Spirit, yet they are rejecting God's truth, the Torah, it is the false spirit of emotionalism that possesses them. Revelation 14, verse 4. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, Here is the perseverance of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Lesson, we must be sanctified. After the process of sanctification, there should be no more contaminants left in us. Otherwise, we'll not be able to enter the most holy place and dwell with the Lord. Now, in this big picture, we see coverings. Paul said, put on the armor of God. He was not talking about the armor of the pagan Roman soldier. It's the covering of the high priest that we must put on. I want to call your attention to a couple of things in Exodus chapter 28, verses 29 through 30. It says, and you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. This is the righteous acts of God's people. Urim means lights, and Thummim means perfections. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 8, it says, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The bride of Christ will be arrayed in the best linen, the righteous acts of the saints of God. Also on the breastplate, on the priest, was God's four-letter name, the Tetragrammaton yud heh vah Here's the lesson for us. God is a consuming fire of love. If any darkness comes into his presence, it is consumed. The priest garments included a golden bell and a pomegranate. When Aaron ministered and went into the holy place, he would carry incense and smoke, which was to protect him from the Shekinah glory of God, God's character. This is why God gives specific instructions on how to make ourselves pure and to be able to draw near to him. The purer we are, the safer we are in his presence. Sanctification, folks, is a long process. For mankind, it's taken from the time of Moses till now, and it will take from now to the end of the millennium for even a few people to be made ultimately pure. In the end, it will be Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith that completes the task. When God's word is fully written on our hearts, then we will be purified. Yeshua is interceding for us constantly, and Satan stands day and night before God accusing us. God is pursuing us because it is Yeshua who is the character of God revealed. Every person destined to the eternal flames of hell can thank Yeshua for it is his efforts that plucks us out of the fire. Hebrews 9 verse 11, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. Now, completing our big picture of this portion of scripture, we see Yeshua as the anchor of our soul. Hebrews 6, verses 19 and 20. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, 
both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Melchizedek priesthood is the highest order of priesthood. It's higher than Aaron's priesthood because it precedes the Levitical priesthood. Christ is truly our path to overcoming our shortcomings in this world. Our Lord can be touched with our infirmities because there was a lot of sin in his family line. Through David, he had lust, murder, and sexual sin through rehab, prostitution, through lot, incest. He had every type of sin that we could be tempted with in his ancestral line, including diet, since Adam and Eve ate the wrong food. In every way, we have a high priest who is touched by our infirmities. He was not only tempted as we are through the contamination of the world, but through ancestral sin, Satan had permission to tempt him, but he overcame it all. Revelation 3, verse 21. I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Folks, it's not a sin to be tempted, only to act upon it. We cannot hold to sin in our minds because we begin to cherish it, and like any seed, anything you hold in your mind will give birth when watered a little. There is no excuse. We have the written word in the Torah and an example in the living word, Yeshua. We have his spirit helping us in our feebleness. Yeshua said to God in John 17, verse 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. In Proverbs 28, verse 9, Whoever turns away his ear from hearing the Torah, even his prayer is an abomination. Here's our lesson. Don't behold yourself, behold God and his Torah. In the outer court of the Holy of Holies, we're to die to self and submit to God. Then we confess and turn from our ways. At the entrance, we receive justification by faith at the altar of salvation. We move to the inner court where we go through the process of sanctification, and through this process, we're set apart as a pure and holy bride. Through the purity we find, we shine the light of Torah to the nations. We live a life of harmony with God through Torah obedience, the character of God unleavened by sin. Our righteous life mixed with prayer is like a fragrant aroma to the Lord. God has made a covenant with man. In that covenant, he did not pledge to do everything for us. He promised to prosper us, to be with us through the trials of life, and to never leave us if we live within the parameters of his instructions. Living within the parameters of his word is our part of the covenant. This means we worship him on the Sabbath and observe his appointed feast days at the time that he appointed. It means we follow his instructions on how to love him and please him and how to love our fellow man. When we reach the Holy of Holies, our purity will allow us to stand before God without His glory consuming us. Through the work of Yeshua on the cross and the sanctification we must go through, the veil is lifted and we have access to God. We are being sanctified as priests before God. We are keeping God's commandments and feeding on the spiritual manna, which is the living Torah. We are being purified to be a place for God to dwell. Psalm 77, verse 13. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Folks, God is building a nation. Do you get the picture? Shabbat Shalom.